Hey everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't been posting a ton. Um, it turns out it's a little more complex to produce a 10 or a 20 minute YouTube video than it is to produce a one to three minute TikTok video in one take. Uh, so hopefully as I gain facility in this, I'll be able to post more regularly. But while I'm working on a couple of other videos right now, I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce my hermeneutic uh, my exegetical approach to the Bible, just so you're aware of some of my own assumptions and presuppositions and methodological frameworks. Uh, because I am going, I'm not approaching the Bible from a devotional point of view, and I think I've made that clear already. It's going to be purely academic, but I also have some somewhat unique approaches to the Bible based on my own academic experiences. Uh, when I was starting my second master's thesis, I wanted to write on the development of the concept of monotheism. And as I started researching, I kept coming back to the question of what is a deity? And I realized I was not going to be able to write this thesis until I could figure that out. But I was not finding any research out there that answered the question in a way that I thought was comprehensive or particularly decisive. And I was at Trinity Western University, just outside of Vancouver in British Columbia, and we had a, the Canada Institute of Linguistics associated with our campus. Uh, they call it CanIL, and I had some friends who were uh, in that program, and they introduced me to something called cognitive linguistics. And one of the principles of cognitive linguistics that turned out to be phenomenally helpful was a theory called prototype, prototype theory, excuse me, which is a theory of classification based on how our mind organizes categories and classes. So it's not based on an Aristotelian approach where we take a category and we figure out what feature or condition is shared by all members of the category and only all members of the category. That's traditional approach to definition, reducing things to the shortest list of necessary and sufficient features. And we do that because it facilitates very clear and easy boundaries. It makes it very easy to delineate and demarcate uh, categories. This was not phenomenally helpful for studying deity because it seemed like there were fuzzy boundaries. It seemed like it was not so much a binary as a spectrum between humanity and deity. And I had seen that observation made in other scholarship that was not based on cognitive linguistics, but it struck me that prototype theory offered a way to an empirical basis for that observation and for better understanding why precisely there did seem to be this spectrum of humanity to deity. And prototype theory is based on some uh, research within the field of uh, psychology and evolutionary psychology and cognitive science. It showed that our minds naturally group things into categories, not based on necessary and sufficient features, but based on some perception of proximity, whether it is functional, whether it is essential, whatever our mind decides is some kind of proximity, it can group things around that cognitive exemplar and create a category. So when we experience uh, when we have experiences with language and with the ways that words are used, we naturally create these categories based on a cognitive exemplar, a prototype, kind of the ideal conceptualization of this thing. And then we group all of the instantiations or the examples of it around it. Uh, sometimes, some things are closer to the prototype, some things are further away from the prototype. So one of the experiments that was conducted that helped to develop this theory was asking uh, psychology students to rate examples of, say, fruit according to how well they represented the category. So things like strawberries and apples were at the top of the list, but things like olives and figs and tomatoes were at the bottom of the list. And this was consistent. Everybody had more or less the same ranking, which suggested that conceptual categories are graded you have members of the category that are closer to the center are more prototypical, and then you had members of the category that were closer to the periphery, were less prototypical, and they get to a point where their membership is debatable, 
where it may seem like a member of the category in some circumstances and then not in others. And that's where they can also overlap with other categories. And so I realize this creates a wonderful tool for trying to understand the relationship of humanity to deity in the Hebrew Bible. So my second master's thesis was uh, I switched from looking at monotheism to looking at the conceptualization of deity in the Hebrew Bible through the lens of cognitive linguistics and prototype theory in particular. So when I look at categories, I am looking at them through the methodological lenses of cognitive linguistics. And in addition to the fact that we do not naturally, intuitively create, learn, or use categories based on necessary and sufficient features, which is why I don't define things, because that's what definition is, and that is artificial, and that is generally attached to structuring power and identity politics and things like that. So I do not use definitions, for the most part, for conceptual categories. I use this prototype theory to understand what are the prototypes of these concepts, what sit closer to the periphery, what overlaps with other categories, and what has debatable membership within a category. So that's one of the insights from prototype, uh, from cognitive linguistics that I'm going to use as I approach the Bible. Another is that texts have no inherent meanings. And what this means is that there's no meaning on this cover. You can't wipe meaning off of here. You can't shake it off. Meaning does not travel into our eyes and into our brain. Um, there's no meaning in the ink on a page and the pixels on a screen riding the sound waves into your ears or in signs for people who, uh, who sign. Meaning is created entirely in our minds. And what words and sounds and signs are are encodings of meaning and the meaning does not inhabit those codes we have to decode them based on our own experiences with the language so as when we grow up when we're uh, infants and when we're learning how to speak we learn that certain sounds are associated with certain concepts certain semantic content and when we hear this, those sounds, our minds know, well, that's associated with this. And as it gets more complex and we get phrases and we get clauses and we get sentences, we have to be able to decode the semantic content that is associated with them. So when I say something to someone, what I'm doing is I'm thinking of my experiences with these agreements that we've reached regarding what semantic content will be associated with what combinations of sounds and words. And I decide how I can most closely approximate the, con the semantic content in my head, and then I express that linguistically. The person on the other end has to take that, that linguistic expression and based on their own experiences with the relationships between combinations of sounds and semantic content, they then create in their minds from scratch their best guess at what my intended meaning was. And because this, we developed this facility for uh, decoding and encoding uh, throughout our childhood and throughout our lives, much of it is instantaneous. We don't have to think about it. And most of it is good enough. And that's why language exists. It, needed to be good enough to help us. And so it's not perfectly precise. There's very, very rarely an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between the linguistic expression and the semantic content, but it's good enough. And there are a number of interesting implications of this. One, this is one of the reasons we misunderstand people a lot, because when we encode stuff, we're not always perfect at it. Sometimes we're moving too fast, Sometimes we slip up. Sometimes our experiences differ from another's experiences. And similarly, when we decode stuff, sometimes we're moving too fast. Sometimes we're not considering all kinds of different contexts that can influence why somebody may have encoded what they meant the way they did. An example of this is uh, my first week in Oxford. I was on Corn Market Street, this foot traffic uh, retail district 
in Oxford and I saw a KFC and I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to go have lunch there. So I went in and I asked if they had biscuits because KFC has biscuits. And I, it was my first week in, in the UK and I did not remember that they use the word biscuits very differently over there. And the person was like, why would we have biscuits? And I was like, oh, that's right. That's right. Biscuits means cookies over here. And then I realized I couldn't think of how to describe what it was precisely that I wanted. And so I kind of, I remember this old kids in the hall skit where it's, like, it's about this bit. I saw one when I was in Paris. <sighs> um, I could not describe what I wanted. And so I went across the street to Burger King instead. But if I had n had adequate experience, I would have probably described a scone and I still wouldn't have had it. So it wouldn't have helped me. But we can only understand language to the degree that we have experience with it or that we can draw inferences about meaning based on the experiences that we do have. Sometimes we can use the words and the context around something to understand more or less what a word means. And other times we can't, we have no idea what uh, a word means and we don't know how to um, situate it in the, the uh, linguistic construction. And that's what dictionaries are for. They help us to get a rough start on understanding what something means. But we then have to go have experiences with the word so that we can fill out the contours and the extent of the semantic category. So those are the two aspects of cognitive linguistics I'm going to apply to the Bible. And the latter one is important because when we're looking at the Bible in translation or in the original text, we're looking at something that was written thousands of years ago by people who were operating with an entirely different set of understandings and set of agreements and sets of experiences. And so it's so much more difficult to reconstruct what the intended meaning was. We have to try to approximate what their experiences were, what those agreements about the relationships of combinations of sounds to meaning were and that's phenomenally difficult and when we translate sometimes we artificially create a sense of familiarity and that can make us think we understand the text better than we actually do and you know it may be good enough to get a, a rough understanding but it may not help us understand all the depth and all the nuances and there may be important meaning that's hiding in those depths and the better we can reconstruct some of those ancient frameworks and experiences and agreements, maybe the more we can excavate uh, out of the text. But we're always creating the meaning in our heads. We are never finding meaning in the text. We're always creating it. And with thousands of years of interpretations in between the finalization of those texts and our creating meaning by looking at them all that interpretation influences how we look at it so that creates an additional that's an additional monkey wrench to throw into that that there are going to be other readings that we may consider authoritative that may weigh on how we are reconstructing that meaning and it may be difficult for us to uh, approximate what was intended if readings that we consider to be authoritative carry more weight than maybe they should. So I am going to be trying to parse those things apart in the videos I post on here. And I'm gonna to try to talk about some of the ways that they their agreements differed. So it's not gonna be incredibly technical linguistic content, but I am gonna talk about different ways that they use words, different ways that they use concepts. So when I uh, talk about passages that talk about deity, for instance, uh, I'm going to describe, you know, that they understood deity a bit differently than we do now. When I talk passages that talk about personhood, talk about spirits, talk about souls, talk about the afterlife, I'm going to try to orient us a little bit towards how they understood things back there. And sometimes it's going to sound pretty alien and other times it's going to sound pretty intuitive. Um, so I guess be ready for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to cover in this video is univocality. 
one of the most common ways that people approach the Bible these days is presuming univocality. And what that means is that they presume the whole Bible from start to finish represents a single, unified, consistent voice. And this means that interpreting this passage way over here in the Hebrew Bible can be done by using this passage way over here in the New Testament. Uh, and that's just not the way it works because these two passages had no relationship whatsoever until they were brought together in the Bible, which did not happen in the lifetimes of either authors or audiences, it happened well after. So the meaning we create in our heads when we bring these two passages together and we try to harmonize them and we create a reading that can reconcile both of them, that reading that we create is artificial and rarely has anything to do with what was intended or what was understood by the authors and audiences of those two different texts. So I had a video on TikTok I shared about this, the concept of the God of the Bible. When we talk about the God of the Bible, we generally are talking about a way that we have taken all the different texts of the Bible and tried to distill it down into a single divine profile. And certain things we foreground and certain things we background, and we create this image of this figure. That image that we create was never possible for anyone who wrote anything that now exists in the Bible because the whole Bible as we have it now did not come together until well after the final person who wrote text for the Bible was dead. No one saw all of these texts together in the way that we see them now. And so one of the main things that I'm going to do is I'm going to pull apart texts and I'm going to try to allow them to operate on their own terms to the degree possible. And sometimes that means within a single chapter I'm going to say we have multiple different authors working here. And this was probably one author. This is probably another. I'm not going to go wild with, you know, this word in this verse is one uh, author. And then there's this other redactor responsible for these other words. And, you know, try to parse apart the literary strata of a single verse in that much detail. But I will talk about where the main literary seams seem to be, the ones that are the most clear, the most defensible, and make the most sense of the data. So I'm not going to presuppose univocality. I'm going to talk about how certain texts that are attributed to Paul are probably Pauline. Other texts are probably not. I'm going to acknowledge that James is directly contradicting Paul. When James says, uh, now you see that uh, a man is justified by works and not just by faith, that is saying Paul is wrong. Or at least I think of it differently from Paul. And the attempt to reconcile the two and say, well, no, you just have to think of the works that James addresses as the fruit of the faith rather than what builds the faith. Um, that's a, a univocal approach. I'm going to let these texts disagree because they did disagree. Uh, and it means the Bible is going to get messy. It means the Bible is going to get phenomenally complex. But that's the way it is. That's the way it was. It did not come together in a very clean, single, easy trajectory. It was a messy process. And we're going to get into that and see about how people... Uh, disagreed with each other, and some texts were intended to uh, probably correct other texts. For instance, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the two different creation accounts. The one in Genesis 2 is probably earlier, and it features a deity who is very anthropomorphic, makes sound as they walk through the garden, creates the human from the earth with their hands. Uh, the verb there is a verb that refers to creating pottery, uh, makes mistakes, creates the human, and is like, hmm, needs something. All right, let's make all the animals. It's not good that they are alone. Hmm, that's not right. Okay, we're gonna make uh, the woman. Okay, hey, 
don't do this stuff. Hey, they did that stuff. The deity is constantly having to fix or improve on the creation. And then we've got Genesis 1, which comes in, and with everything that is created, the author says, and God saw that it was good. And this is a way to say, no, God does not have to improve on or fix their creations. Everything is good from the start. And it is using loftier language. God does not create by getting their hands dirty in the clay. God creates by divine fiat. God speaks everything into existence. Genesis 2, God is focused on the earth. Starts off, God created the earth and the heavens. Genesis 1 starts off, God created the heavens and the earth. And so it is loftier and then zooms in on what's going on on the earth. Uh, so these two texts, one was earlier, the other comes in to try to probably correct some of what's going on in the other one. And they got stuck together, likely because of archival concerns. Somebody probably wanted to make sure they were both preserved. So maybe they put them together on a single scroll. And then a few generations down the road, they get read as a single narrative. And that's how, we, uh, that's how we tend to approach it today, those who approach it univocally anyway. So we're going to try to tease some of these things apart and see what has been put next to uh, other texts because of archival concerns or where people have intentionally stitched different narratives together. We're going to pull some of those apart. For instance, Joseph being sold into Egypt. You can untangle the two separate narratives and see two freestanding narratives with beginnings, middles, and ends to each of them. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well uh, when we get to that. But I'm not going to presuppose univocality. I'm going to treat the Bible as a messy, complex collection of texts written by authors who frequently disagreed, who are writing for very different reasons, frequently in different languages, and had different rhetorical goals. That's going to be a very important part of trying to understand what they were doing. It's trying to understand uh, what the goals they had for the text were. And things like genre are going to be very important to that. So anyway, those are a couple of kind of broad, important principles that are going to inform my approach to the Bible in these videos. Um, and I'm rambling probably for far too long, but I wanted to get that out there uh, in a video before I start sharing uh, more detailed thoughts so that people understand what they can expect. Uh, from these videos. So uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, I hope you'll let me know in the comments what kinds of things uh, you would like to see me address in these videos. And I will hopefully uh, see you before too long.